Good morning. It's time for us to get started this morning. Glad to see everybody here. Um, thanks, David. Thanks to David for starting us off last week with this class. Uh, we're the, looking this quarter at the different prayers that we see in uh, the, of Paul and seeing what we can learn from those things as we study about prayer together. So that's where we'll take off with this morning. I know last week was kind of an overview and just looking at prayer in general and uh, I listened to the class. It sounded like there was a, a lot of great discussion about um, how we use prayer, understanding the power of prayer, trying to appreciate how that affects our lives as Christians and how we can be more effective in using it. And those are all great things to think about. So as we go through some of these other lessons, we're going to be much more specific about the different types of of examples of prayer that we see in God's word and what those do, how those affect our life. And, and practically, I hope in every lesson that we'll, we'll take the time to kind of end with how does this affect me? We're going to look at examples. We're going to look at, um, at different things that we find in the word of God. But then, you know, kind of prepare yourself mentally. We want to have a discussion just, you know, maybe the last few minutes of class as to how we put what we learned this morning into our life to help us. Uh, that's the purpose of studying some of these things. So I want to make sure that we, we take some time to do that. So as we get started this morning, uh, we're lesson two. If you didn't get that, it's back there uh, between the double doors and the foyer. Um, if you need a chance to grab that, and lesson three is back there as well for next week. Let's begin this morning by going to God in prayer and, and thinking about some of these things together. So if you'll join me in doing that. Our awesome and great Father in heaven, it's a privilege to come before you this morning and to, to know that you hear your children, those who are faithful and who, who commit themselves to you. We thank you that we're able to come before you and to worship you, to study from your word. We're so thankful that you have blessed us with your will, that you've revealed to us what you would have us to be and what you would have us to know. As we think about so many of the things that you have created, so many of the things that you have promised and accomplished, we stand in awe, Father, of your faithfulness and your wisdom, your sovereignty over, or over all that is. We entreat you this morning as we come before you that you would help us understand how to have the right heart, to open our hearts and to have open eyes and ears to what you would want us to know. We pray that as we study through this idea of prayer and of entreating you that we can appreciate what we have seen others do and grow in our own spiritual lives from those things. We're so thankful that you hear us. We're so thankful that you are there, but also, Father, we're thankful that your wisdom far outweighs our own and that as we come to you with different requests and different things throughout our life that you know what is best we pray that you would continue to do what is best for us in our lives and help us to, to learn to understand those answers and to accept them and to praise and glorify you for the things that you do in our lives. We're thankful for your care for us. There are many on our minds who need your help even this morning. We pray that you would be with them and that you would bless them in their needs and comfort them. Thank you so much for our Savior who shows us through his example how to come before you and how to obey and to submit to your will. We pray this morning that we will do those things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so thinking about these different types of, of prayers that we find throughout the, God, throughout the Word of God and, and these different examples, we want to start this morning thinking about this idea of an entreaty. So I think you know what the first question is. What is, what is an entreaty? If you've read through the lesson, you've seen some of these prayers, what would you say, what would you say that is? How would you define a prayer of entreaty? What do you think? Yeah. Asking, begging. Okay, asking and begging. That's, that's, a, that's starting us down the, the path of what we're thinking about because a lot, there are different prayers that we may pray that have to do with asking, we just prayed together a moment ago, and, and we asked God for some things. And so all prayer, maybe all prayer has some asking, but entreating, uh, you know, Mary Beth said the idea of begging is one thing. What else? What else do you think about when you think about the idea of entreating and going to God in prayer? Anything? 
Okay. How, how is it that entreating prayer is different than just maybe asking a question or asking for something? What do you think? Yeah, Cliff. Because a, a, a deeper desire, people want this outcome. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. A deeper desire, as if you didn't hear what he said, um, a sense of urgency, maybe, is what we would say as we think about that. And so, you know, if you just define the word entreaty as it, as it relates to prayer, um, you know, an earnest request um, or petition, and the idea of a plea, and that's what we want to th start thinking about as we look at some of these examples this morning. Eric, did you have something? Yeah, it also signifies that the, the individual or the being you're praying to has, a, has some authority, has some power yeah. to bring you what you're asking. Yeah. That's a great point. And that's what, we want to, that's what we want to understand as we get into this this morning, that, that when you think about the idea of a prayer of entreaty, we are necessarily coming to God with an understanding that he can fulfill that. You know, if, if, if I go to someone just in secular life and entreat them to do something, you know, if I'm urgently requesting or pleading for them to do something, I'm assuming they can do it. Um, you know, I'm not going to, to go to, um, let's say I'm not going to go to a veterinarian and entreat him to help me with some of my health problems, but he may have some, some knowledge, but he's not maybe the expert who can actually take care of it. I want to go to a doctor, right? And, you know, that's, that's one example, but we want to remember that, that God has the power to be able to answer these things. So, yeah, Dwight? Yeah, you know, David is a, a prime example of that. When David prayed for his son, he entreated God to, to save the child. Yeah. And believing he could do it. Yeah. Right. That's a great example. I, I didn't have that one down. That, that's a good example. There's, you know, he's coming to God, begging for something that no one else can do. God could save that child, and he's the only one who could save that child. And so that's one of the things that, that we want to think about when we think about this idea of, of entreating, this earnest and urgent request. Um, you know, it, the, one of the definitions here, a pressing solicitation. So an, entreat, an entreatment, um, someone who's entreating someone, is probably not going to be in the sense of, um, well, this is just something I'm going to casually ask once and see what happens, and if it's, if it's a no, it's a no, and, you know, you go on from there. Uh, that's not the idea that we see here. Anything else? Anybody else have a comment on that, on what it is or, or what it means? Yeah. There was the widow that entreated the judge. Another example. Okay. Yeah. Kept, kept asking, kept asking. Yeah, and Luke 18 shows us about how persistent... Um, she was in, in coming in and asking for vengeance from, from her enemy. Yeah. Yeah. So we see this idea in different, in different places. We're going to look at just a couple examples this morning and hope to answer the questions of, of, of how it affects what we do. So when we think about that, you know, what are some occasions where we or others use this type of prayer? What's some situations maybe that you might think of? Where we do this. Yeah, John? When a loved one or even someone we're concerned about is ill. Okay. All right. We have a, a kind of a sense of urgency there. We're, we're going to God in prayer, trying to entreat them for something like that. What else? It, whether whether and uh, positive or negative, yeah, you know, either one. The lesson talks about that, that concept a little bit. Anything else you can think of where, where we see that happening? Yeah. We feel the spiritual guilt of our sin. Okay. So we go, we call upon the one, the only one who has any, has any power to do anything about that. And that is a, that is a begging because that's the only place that we can go. Okay. Yeah. I go back to David, that, that example of David, when he realized his sin, um, and then treating God upon the child's behalf, part of that was looking for forgiveness for what happened. Yeah. Kevin. If we could, would compare uh, Jesus when he prayed twice, mm -hmm. when he gave uh, thanks for the bread, this was kind of a common Thing that he did, mm -hmm. he blessed the bread, but it actually means he gave thanks for it. Right, that's right. But when he prayed in the garden and sweat drops, drops of blood, yeah, that's very different. Yeah, you're right. You're right. We're gonna look at that passage here in a little bit. That's great. Yeah. Anything else that anybody think of as far as entreating and what you know what? Where do we see this? How about what about those who, you know, have not been 
who are not born again Christians, who are not following the Bible example, but sometimes they pray. You ever see entreating type of prayers there? Think about that. You know, there's someone who, who hasn't really followed after God, but they decide sometimes in very urgent situations to pray um, because, you know, life is threatened or something horrible has happened. And, and even if they're sincere, maybe don't know what to do, this is generally the type of prayer that you see. This urgent plea, this begging, coming to God. Um, it's kind of a realization of, okay, here is someone who can, or I hope that can do something about it. And so that, that's the idea that we see in this type of prayer all the way around. That's, that's, what, that's what we want to understand as, as we kind of think about those things. Um, so where do we find things like this? We've mentioned a couple of examples. Anything else you can think of? Where do we see prayers like this in the Bible? David has been mentioned. Uh, we'll talk about the one from Jesus here in a moment. Anything else uh, that comes to mind? You think about this idea of a prayer of entreaty? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we say that. I think that's a good example. Yeah, we see her, you know, urgently coming to God, asking, um, asking for that. Uh, something that, that was lacking in her life. Yeah, that's a good example. What else? Yeah, Paul's, uh, Paul's prime example mm -hmm. uh, in Crete when he prayed uh, at uh, whatever the thorn of the flesh was. Mm -hmm. He absolutely moved and he, and of course, it wasn't, but yet he prayed earnestly. Yeah, it would have, and gave the name God could do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's read that together. That's one of the examples in the lesson. We'll focus on that for just a few minutes here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 6. You know, as Paul's talking about his life and about his service to God, um, not in a boastful way, but he gets to this point here in, ch in chapter 12 and verse 6 where he says this. He says, though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So Paul talks about what is wrong. He doesn't tell us specifically what that thorn is. We've, many have debated that for years and years. But there's something that is there in his life that wasn't there before, that's there for a reason he seems to acknowledge and know. And he's asked God urgently, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this. That's a prayer of entreaty. We'll come back to him here in just, in just a minute or two as we think about that. What else? Anybody else think of any prayers of entreaty that, that come to mind? Kevin mentioned it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up there. What about, uh, you know, what about Jesus? You think about Jesus here in John chapter 12. This is, bef this is not while he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, but notice what he says here as he's thinking about what his purpose is. And, and this is right before the, the passage we've studied a couple of times lately where he says that he's going to draw all people to himself by going to the cross. He says here, he says, now, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This is a, a prayer in a sense to God, but he's expressing some sorrow, some, some difficulty, and entreating his father. We also see it in Matthew. Uh, we have it in different, different gospel accounts, but Matthew, I thought, did a good job of, of explaining it for our lesson. Here we find Jesus in the garden. And this is a very different prayer, as Kevin pointed out, from him praying to, to bless the bread before they partook of it uh, and ate together. He says here in the garden, he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And then going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I mean, I think that is, that really encompasses everything that we want to think about in the idea of an entreating type of prayer. Jesus, you know, God in the flesh, coming to his Father, entreating him. Uh, Luke, Luke goes on to point out that, that so earnestly he prayed, sweat fell as drops of blood. 
It's hard to imagine that. But think if you have ever found yourself in that situation where you are praying that way. Or if you haven't found yourself there, can you get there? Where you're willing to depend upon God like he did. And so we start to think about that and think about, you know, Paul's prayer of entreaty here as we, as we think about some of these things together. Um, you know, we, we talked about what, what, it, what it means here. So here's the question. What is Paul asking for? You know, here's, here's the simple question for anybody who hasn't answered yet. What's Paul asking for in his prayer of entreaty? But, yeah, Alan? Yeah. He's asking, he's asking for that why. Something that he needs, right? Something he feels like is going to help him. Something uh, that he feels like would, would cause him to be able to do what he's doing better. So, I mean, that's why he's asking, right? Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, when Paul talks about this, he, uh, it's, a, it's a physical thing for him. Right? And it can be anything. Uh, suppose a migraine is part of that good here. Something is physical hindering him. He thinks God can take care of Right. Yeah, and th th that's one thing that we want to keep in mind with this is, you know, he's asking God for this. And that's kind of where I was getting at as, as to why Alan got us there. Uh, because, as it was mentioned before, here's someone who can do something about it. And, you know, I don't know what medicine was in, in Paul's day and time. And obviously there was not something that medicine or, or science of the time could do about whatever it was that was his thorn in the flesh. And he's asking God for that. He's entreating him. He's going to, to him for that. So when we think about that, what was the answer? What answer did he get from God as far as his, his entreating him about this thorn in the flesh? Yeah, my grace is sufficient, right? So that, that's a no, right? Uh, I'm not going to take this away from you right now. And, and Paul explains to us the reason why. Um, so how does he take that answer? How does Paul deal with that? Because uh, before you answer that, think about this. Paul said, when we read that passage, three times I pleaded with him to have this removed. I mean, think about the language that's being used there. And, you know, think about us coming to God when you have, a, if we're going to talk about medical things, an urgent medical need. Life-threatening. Life-changing. And think about your mindset in coming to God and pleading. I mean, that's, that's the sense I get of what Paul is saying here. And the answer was, my grace is sufficient. How did how does Paul take that? Yeah, wait. Yeah, he uh, he accepted what the answer was, but no, just like we talked about David, that's just like David. He didn't eat or anything during the time he was praying to God to save the child. But when the child died, he got up. He accepted what God's answer was. Yeah. yeah. Now, when we think about examples like that, we, the example of David and even the example of Paul, that's that's starting to show us something. Are, do, do you think that Paul or David had any, uh, when their answer was no, that they, they, didn't, they didn't really want that, and they just kind of shrugged their shoulders, okay, well, I guess, I guess not. You know, it's something that they desperately wanted, but we see what they did with God's answer. We'll look at a scripture in a minute. i got a couple comments. Eric? Yeah, Paul also said in Philippians 4, verse 12, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay. That's his perspective. Right, right. What, whatever the situation is, I can, I can do it through Christ. Okay, right. And we, that's one thing we want to keep in mind as we're going through the rest of this. You know, Entreaties are there. We see them. We see uh, we see people coming before God in this desperate way, um, and we see both positive and negative responses. How are we going to deal with these things? Got a couple different ones here. Seth, did you have something? Can it be harder for us though because we don't get the direct answer that Paul got? He, he got God telling my grace is sufficient, and I guess we could draw on that ourselves. Well, we could ask three, four, five times. And Although maybe the prayer hasn't been answered the way we want right then, we're not getting a direct answer from God. In the, in the sense that those that God maybe spoke directly to, yes, that's true. Um, part of it, I would say, has to do with then, um, you know, in our time and our dispensation, 
you know, persistence in prayer and patience. Yeah, I mean, it may, maybe the answer isn't going to come in our timeline. And God, who lives outside of time, may look at things differently. I mean, maybe our answer is years away. Or maybe it, finally we decide, okay, the, the answer is no. A couple different things here. Here, Nancy. He doesn't have to remember. Christ said he had to go to the cross. That he didn't, you know, he didn't want to go there. But he said, nevertheless, your will, not my will. And I think when we pray, when we pray for something, it's Oh my, it's like the Lord's will. Right. Line will up with his will. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, what, uh, that's one, of the thing, one point that I hope that we'll take away from this. Even in an entreaty, you know, an urgent plea, um, still we need to remember and, and understand that we are yielding ourselves to God. A couple different things. Did I see one over here? Jake, yeah. So to the, to the point of, you know, we don't know for sure whether he's going to answer us in our timeline or when we want it or whether he's going to give us the answer that we're, we're wanting or it's going to be the result that we want i'd say he still wants us to pray about it. even if he, you know he knows that we're the, what he what he's going to say he knows how he's going to answer that right but uh, i think it's still our duty to if we you know have a wish of god just going to him like you said is is acknowledging him as somebody who can't answer it's still glorifying him so you know whether whether you think it's going to be answered or not or whether it's answered in the way you want it i i'd say that you know you should still pray for those things yeah a couple things there you know the idea of glorifying god you know looking to him as the father coming to him and treating him that that does glorify him and our dependence upon him it, we're, we're we are proclaiming our dependence on god when we are willing to entreat him in that way even though the answer may be no you think about jesus you go back to that example you know, my own opinion, Jesus knew what God's will was. This had been the plan since the foundation of time. And, but in that moment, he still showed his submission and his dependence upon the Father. Even though he knew, probably, what the answer was going to be, he did that. And that's a good example for us. Charlie, do you have something? You know, I was thinking that uh, in David's case, he continued to plead mm -hmm. until the death of a child. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so until uh, he got an answer, God maybe God didn't specifically answer him audibly, but the child died. There's the answer. And so, you know, to your point, Seth, earlier, there's, there's some ways that we can know some answers. Some are more definitive than others, but, but yet David was persistent with that entreaty until then. A couple of different ones here. Yeah, Elaine? Um, just like as I've gotten somewhat older um, with praying and realizing that sometimes the answer that God gives is not like a one-time thing. Like okay. it's, a, um, it's more of a process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like as we mature, we can see God working in our lives and answering our prayers sure. over time. Um, and then um, there's a song I like right now that says, God, don't take this away from me until you make me stronger. Okay. And, and that's how I've been looking at some things in my life that... God's answering them over time and starting to notice his answers more helps me to give them. Yeah. 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 So there's this idea that as we entreat God and we come to him that way, we're growing, uh, we're developing, and God is perhaps then answering us in accordance with where we are and what we need because his wisdom far exceeds ours and he knows best. Do you have something, Nathan? Uh, would you say that Paul or Jesus or David was passionate about? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So many times in, in like in today, and like when we look at sports or watching a game, even mm -hmm. in our own lives, we equate passion and effort with results. Yeah. yeah. We want to put <clears throat> those results tangible. We want to see and, and, and see those results and, and feel those results. But with this, just because we're passionate about something and, and showing a lot of effort and, and uh, fervent, fervency, I guess I would say, uh, does not mean you're going to get the result that you want. Yes. yes. Right. And, and I think part of the lesson that we see in these prayers of, of entreating are that yielding to what God's answer is, but not, but not stopping. So a couple other ones here. Yeah, Mary? Yeah, to, to Eric and Nancy's point, the, the answer is always going to be yes, if your attitude and your approach is your will will be done yes. God's will will be done right, right. and so it's, it's an act of uh, of faith 
but our trust is that your will is going to be better than what I right. could even ask for. Right. Yeah. You think of you think of uh, you know as a parent, you think of a child coming and you know children come and entreat you for certain things, um, and you know your answer to them, you're looking at what's best, and you're going to try to give what's best. Um, and sometimes they may be disappointed with that, but hopefully. As they get older, and this is back to what Elaine was saying, they get older, they grow, they realize some things, they realize what, what the path was. And so being able to submit to that is, is absolutely paramount. A couple other ones here. Charlie, did you have something else? I was thinking that in, in uh, David's account, God was glorified whenever David submitted to the idea of pleading for the child's life. Yes. But when the child died, God was not blamed for that death. Okay. He accepted it yes, right. and went on, right. which glorified God again. That's right. We see that in good examples of prayers of entreating. Christ, you know, Jesus is another one. He accepted what God said. He went on and did what God wanted him to do. God was glorified. The plan was accomplished. And, you know, we see that over and over. The, the, the case for entreating type of prayer being something that is positive always has to do with submitting and being willing to un to uh, agree to God's will and appreciating that his way is best. Alan? Yeah, as, as we study our Bible, we learn that uh, God is our benefit, <coughs> therefore uh, he wants us to go to him in prayer and everything we do mm -hmm. and a constant message with him. Uh, but the person who do that, then he's lost. Mm -hmm. and, and being lost through the daytime uh, is very difficult for a person to understand that there's God. He's your answer. Yeah. And you must pray for God. Yep. Yeah. Come, coming, coming to him and, and submitting to him is, is what we see that, that shows us that is so you know you think about paul's comment here in in philippians 3 you know there's his attitude which is what many of us have discussed this morning that he counts everything for loss except for you know for the sake of christ um and that he's trying to gain christ you know is the general message that we see there and so that's how he approached many things and we see that in several different letters that that he wrote you know we real quickly here we you know we the writer of the lesson had romans 8 23 in here and talks about this other idea of entreating he says there in romans 8 23 and not only the creation but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons the redemption of uh, our bodies so what part of this verse is like an entreaty that, that he's talking about here what do you think Groaning inwardly yeah he yeah, talks about talks about um groaning inwardly um, and even the idea there of, of waiting eagerly, you know, there's, it's, it's the mindset, it's a concept of, of what, what it is that, that we're trying to do. And if you go back in Romans 8 to, to verse 18 and 19, um, you, you see, you know, what he's talking about there, about the sufferings of this present time and creation um, waits, e waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, talking about, you know, corruption ending and, and all things being made new through Christ and then eventually Christ coming. So when we think about that, you go to this other verse here. Likewise, the Spirit helps in our weakness, for we did not, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So let's think about just the the concept that that we see here for just a moment, as He talks about this idea of the Spirit helping and. Uh, in our weakness, especially the idea of groanings too deep for words. He intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. When you think about a prayer of entreaty, has there been a time when you felt so overwhelmed by a situation, uh, you know, a lot of times it's a health situation, or maybe it's a relationship situation, I, I, I can't find the words. I don't know what to ask for. What do you think about that as it relates to this? Yeah, Seth. God knows the intents of your heart. Okay. And in your heart, there might be things that are words for it. Okay. All right. Talks about the Spirit searching those things and, and helping with that. Yeah, Jake? Um, I remember a couple times where I've, I've been 
um, very, I guess, brought low and uh, just over the realization um, <laughs> of the, uh, the the nature of sin, the uh, the effects I see in the world, um, the uh, the turning from God on my life, like uh, from my life to uh, the world, you know, just just everything, and, and it kind of overwhelms me. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk to God about that, and I want to pray. But sometimes there's just so, there's, either there's so many things I could say, or there's there's not enough, or sure. I don't have it. Um, but I just break down, and and I think there's times when um, you know it, you don't really have anything to say, but God God's there, and okay. he, and he and He knows. All right. So yeah, you think about this and and what God has provided us. You know. The Holy Spirit, you know, providing the Word of God to us, of helping us to understand the will of God, the mind of God. That's how He works today, uh, is, is through the Word of God. And so, you know, but being able to, to go to God in prayer and having, uh, being able to have that comfort and knowing that if I can't find the words, there is, you know, there's, there's still help there. Uh, and, and thinking about it that way. Yeah, Alan? Uh, can you think of an example of you? In your life or my life, I say my life too. Where I understand what's going on with people in the spirit. You can't uh, put your finger on it. Mm -hmm. But things are going on that if you're a Christian, I guess it's interceding for it, but you may not know it. Sure, there, there, there's plenty of things we can look at that we may not completely understand. But we can look to God's word and do what he has told us we can do and be comforted by the help that we know exists. And so that, that's a great thing to think about. Yes. Part of that, for we do not know what to pray for as we ask. So mm -hmm. think about, you know, we, we reference Jesus' prayer where he says, not my will, but right. your will. One of the things that we don't know is what God's will is on certain situations. Mm -hmm. We have the revealed will of God, but in this specific situation, what should I pray for? Right. What is God's will in this situation? So that's part, that's part of that groaning um, helping us understand when we don't know what to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that acknowledgement that God, your will be done, whatever that is. And being willing to submit to that. Yeah. I think that's a good point. And, and you know, Revelation 2.23 that he referenced in the lesson tells us that God is one who knows the hearts and minds. He can search that. He can understand that. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's something for us to think about. So just... As we wrap up here, our time has quickly slipped away. So some things to consider. You know, how do we respond to entreaties that aren't answered the way that we want them to? We've kind of talked about that a little bit. Anybody have a one more thought about that? You know, how do we respond to that? Yeah, Jake. I like the question there um, in 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 the the lesson um, that says. Uh, are there things when uh, th that you used to want really badly, prayed for, didn't get, but don't want anymore? Yeah. Explain what what could they uh, what could they tell you about the things you want badly now and are praying for? So we just have to trust in God that there's a there's a point you know where he, he knows what's best, and so there's there may even come a point where those things aren't needed anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so to trust God that you know there's going to be enough time for His will to be done in our yeah. lives. Yeah, and and let's not discount something here. It's hard. Sometimes those things are really hard, and they they bring us to tears. They change our life because it's something that we wanted, that we thought was best, that couldn't happen. Does it mean that God doesn't care? Absolutely not. It means that God knows more than we know. And some sometimes the hardest thing to do is to submit to His will and be able to appreciate that, even though we just can't see it. So. You think about that and, 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 you know, about how, you know, how is the wisdom of God seen in answering these things, both positive and negative? You know, we can't see the future, but God can. I've got a couple of examples of that. Hezekiah, he entreated the Lord because he didn't want to die. And God granted that request, didn't he? He gave him 15 more years to live. God had a reason. God had a purpose. There was things he wanted to accomplish in the kingdom. Jesus and Paul asked for something, and, and we might say, well, the answer was no, because that was what? God's will was. And that had a purpose. That had something that had to be accomplished as well. So just think about that. Our, our time is out, is out this morning. But you know, what are we entreating God for today? And as we think about that, you know, what can we be using this type of prayer for? I would submit to you from all the comments that were made this morning, one way we can use it is to show our dependence on God, to glorify Him, 
and be able to appreciate the purpose of his will as we see things happen over time. So that's all the time we have this morning. Thanks so much for all your participation. And lesson three, grab that for next week.